Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to join the 10th South South Forum on Sustainability. Apart from Zoom webinar with simultaneous interpreting in Putonghua, English and Spanish, we are also live streaming in Putonghua for a Chinese audience. For friends on Zoom, please click the global icon and select your preferred language. I thank today's interpreters, Julieta Mendez and Mercedes Picoff for interpreting in English Spanish and uh, Dong Han Yu and Pei Hai Tong for interpreting in English Putonghua. My name is Si Choi Jardi Margaret. I'm Associate Professor at the Institute for Rural Revitalization Strategy at Southwest University, China. I'm also a founding member of Global University for Sustainability. I have been actively involved in the rural reconstruction movement in China since 2000 years. We start the first South South Forum on Sustainability in 2011. In the past nine forums, every section was video recorded and uploaded for free access on our website. For this 10th South South Forum on Sustainability, the central theme is thinking new horizons to go beyond habitual frames of thought and action in order to foster new approaches and form a strong alliance of hope of the South. We did new horizons of thinking. Today, we have the section on the insurgency of the peoples. Particularly, we discuss indigenous thoughts and practice from Latin America. May I introduce the two honorable speakers? Jorge Ishishawa was born in Peru, graduated from the National University of Engineering in Lima and obtained his doctoral at the University of uh, Illinois in 1968. He had worked from 1980s to 1992 in the Peruvian public service, principally in the field of rural development planning. In 1993, he joined the Patek, an uh, Andean project for peasant technologies, and was convinced that the path to autonomy in science and technology late in the affirmation of cultural diversities. He has seen them worked closely with Patek, taught at the Ricardo Pamad University in Lima, run a master program for learning Andean agriculture and, and culture, and is currently a core member of Patek. Jorge San Diego was born in uh, San Cristobal in Chiapas, Mexico in 1943. He studies uh, theology. Since 1969, he has been linked to the life of the indigenous peoples. He is the former director of uh, DESME, uh, Social and Economic Development for Indigenous um, Mexicans. From 1974 to 2008, he worked on developing economic alternatives in over 200 indigenous communities in Chiapas. Mexico. He is also co-author of If the Book, If One Eats, May Everyone Eat, Solidarity Economy, and has traveled extensively in Latin America and Europe, discussing alternative indigenous development in Chavez. He is currently part of the board of directors of the Freya uh, Bartonomi G. La Casas Human Rights Center, of the um, uh, Commission of Assistance Towards Community Unity and Reconciliation. Both of them are founding members of the Global University for Sustainability. They attended the first social forum in 2011. We organized different field trips for overseas friends to understand rural China. Jorge Ishishawa visited uh, Nan Jiechun in Henan province and uh, Zhou Jiazhuang, a people's commune in Hebei province. San Diego, Jorge San Diego visited uh, mountainous villages in Chongqing and the great irrigation system, Dujiangyan, in Chengdu. Along the journeys, we discussed how rural communities struggle with modernization and how we could regenerate ancestor wisdoms. Uh, let us start the dialogue. Um, the first question will be, uh, please briefly introduce yourself, 
how has an intellectual have you come to be involved in the indigenous communities? Please describe how your organization, Patek and uh, Desmi, have taken up technology and development, market and economy with approaches different from the mainstream. Uh, I would like to invite Jose Ishawa to speak first. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margaret. The story is about how having studied civil engineering and having become an expert in structural engineering, uh, going back to Peru and trying to go back to my alma mater, to my uh, engineering school, that was not possible for me at the moment. There was the military coup of 1968 in Peru, and that began with an agrarian reform. I was invited to become part of a team that worked at the Agricultural Ministry at the Office of Agrarian Planning. And that allowed me to to, to start seeing the organization, to start seeing the agricultural landscape from the perspective of the government. So I worked there for a couple of years and then I was invited to be part of a team that conducted a program at the at the university. It was by the Inter-American Development Bank. And that allowed me to become involved with the university system and to get to know it uh, in detail. These things happened two years before I went back to working on planning at the National Planning Institute where I worked for a couple of years. Then I came back to the Ministry of Agriculture and I worked at different programs until at some point, I realized how different the situation was and how difficult it was to uh, implement an agrarian reform as General Velasco would have wanted when he did the military coup. The topic of the agrarian reform was fundamental for him because it was the core of the export perspective that the uh, military officials wanted to have for the country. And that uh, was leaving peasants aside. It, it was leaving the agriculture that had been developing for millions of years in the country aside. It was a, a sort of agriculture that was very well developed, but that meant that there was a need for a change of perspectives. When I saw this from the perspective of the government and when I studied peasants and communities, that entailed um, personal engineering change. And so happily I had the opportunity to participate in the course that was offered by Pratek in its fourth year in 1993. And then afterwards, I, I just continued working with Pratek. And why? Because my colleagues 
when Eduardo Urillo passed away, the, the founding member, well, my colleagues invited me to be part of the team when he died. That was the situation. And then for the last 20 or 25 years, I've been working on this topic. And I tried to, to learn constantly. I never stopped learning. And now I realized with this uh, horrendous situation we are going through at the moment that I... I really learned so little. I was able to contribute so little, but nevertheless, that allowed me to become familiar with an international relationship with, for example, with Kim Chi and her group which then became the global you that gave it a whole different context at least to the work that I was doing I don't know if that describes my my path well well but as an engineer the reason why we started working in protect was uh, peasant technologies and that was the first purpose especially given uh, Grimaldo Gerhi was the founder of Pratek and he had this idea in mind of, of discussing technologies he was interested in this for so long and then with this institution and this organizations from abroad and, and the funds for example the French funds we were able to start seriously researching peasant technologies and so this is why the topic of technology has been essential to my work. Also, um, I learned a lot about engineering. That is what I could comment on on my career. But as regards developing uh, development and the change that was involved in in establishing a, a dialogue between the existing technology which was very de much developed in agriculture and the institution this international worldwide institution of potatoes that uh, established its headquarters in Peru, which is still ongoing. That meant a huge challenge because it was about uh, contrasting that foreign technology with the technology that was implemented by the peasants in Peru. That led us to see a confrontation from the intellectual point of view as well to see the the value and to practice autonomous or, or peasants own technology now development was also a challenge at the moment because our our Albert Rechnagel, our German friend, he was coordinating the Andean region at the moment. Uh, he was coordinating the German programs, uh, the programs by an NGO called uh, Land and Men. This is a German uh, NGO that at the moment had its headquarters in Cochabamba, Bolivia. 
it was him who I, I remember the first meeting that we had after I took the course in 1993. Well, the next year we met for the first time and it was about saying goodbye to development. So if we were to speak about development, we were going to speak about our own development, not about importing development as we were doing with the International Potato Center at the moment. So that farewell to development was um, an interesting challenge that we tried to, to take on. And this is what we were focused on all this time as Pratek. Unfortunately, we haven't managed to convince um, a large uh, population of agricultural experts. In a way, in Peru and Bolivia, this this method was multiplied. People who are working within official institutions with foreign technology. So that is what I could say about the issue of development and technology. And also uh, the topic of markets is similar to what I, I've been saying. It's not this is about their own agriculture. It's not an agricultural method to sell products. It's um, agriculture to to develop their own lives. So this was the, the economy issue was very important. Economy as it was understood at the moment, agriculture economy. This was also a topic that posed important challenges and this whole time we have been trying to work on that so those could be my comments so far Jorge San Diego please <clears throat> unmute yourself good evening good afternoon good morning thank you for inviting me to participate at this uh enormous forum it's an opportunity that's very important for me to be able to um, discuss with you and also to convey to you a very long experience of work I thought of um, doing a very broad history of the work I've been doing with indigenous peoples. I was finishing my theology studies in 1969 and ever since that year I started to look for paths to meet with indigenous peoples of which I am part in the sense that I have lived all my life in this region of Chiapas in Mexico where the presence of indigenous peoples is very strong. You have live cultures and the peoples are permanently mobilized in the search for changes and in the search for a better life. So in a way, this is part of my uh, interests. It's part of my life. So in 1969, when I started to work in this region, I became part of a movement that's very, very broad, that has a sense of uh, looking for transformation because I was studying uh, theology before that had to do with the Second Vatican uh, Council that had transformed the situation of how to uh, become engaged with reality and how to understand reality. In 1968, the Latin American priests had had a 
a conference at the Latin American level. And at the conference, they had established justice for peoples as a focal point so that there could be a better interpretation of the relationships between peoples to the economic, social, and cultural system. So in this sense, the priests were looking for social justice mainly, and also they sought to understand the the fact that the presence of indigenous communities in Latin America is vital. So they had had a special meeting to understand the dynamics of indigenous peoples and the culture and the value of those peoples and what it means for them to have ancestral knowledge and the wisdom of those people. So in that sense, in 1968, it was also important to see all the movements that uh, were focused on social movements and social mobilization. For example, the Cuban revolution and how they discovered this possibility of the peoples uh, confronting the uh, mainstream dominating system. So in those years, it was very clear that there was this process of revision of reality fundamentally from the anthropology point of view. Social anthropology that was very useful to understand the value of culture and the history of the peoples and what it means for them, um, the conquest and the re colonial relationships in terms of dependency in terms of exploitation and, and denial of the peoples. So this search of the peoples is very important. So I had I understood that there is a vision of processes, an understanding of processes that have to do with the the rising of the awareness of the peoples of being very very of being subjects of history particularly with the work of paulo freire in brazil and the his idea of popular education that showed this understanding or the need of this understanding of reality so as of those years since those years i was we were trying to uh, achieve a process of awareness creation in communities through education and also the creation of some relationships between peoples and understanding the need of exchange of, pro of products and all the knowledge in the lines of social action and development while searching for an Im improvement in communities at the level of health, education, economy, transportation, communication, etc. Uh, a broad understanding in this sense, starting with this element of consciousness or awareness creation in communities. So all of these processes have gone through this and basically the process of understanding through a permanent revision of social sciences, Marxism, communism, fundamental issues and concepts to understand and frame reality. And that have focused or, or have been channeled into permanent ongoing social action in, for the search of justice. And I would like to very broadly mention an important element, which is the fact that from 1974 in this region, there was a Congress of Indigenous Peoples that was celebrated, where peoples spoke, the Indigenous Peoples 
spoke their words and these words this word was linked to the situation of the land of exchange education and health they referred to all these topics and it was also it also entailed denouncing the situation of exploitation that existed and continues to exist in among these peoples and the role of the state in this exploitation as well as other institutions that do not respond to their needs and this also generated the need of organization among the peoples as a fundamental objective in the sense that it would no longer be possible to demand from the state the solution of their problems, but that the peoples themselves would have to search for their own paths. So this started in 1974 in San Cristobal, where this Congress of the Peoples was celebrated. And it was very important in order to generate a broader movement, a movement that grew and different organizational processes that took place after this, also linked to the exercise of movements in Latin America, particularly in Central America, and in general in Mexico, where peasant and native peoples were also looking for the solution of ancestral problems in relation to the land, land tenure particularly. And so this took many years, 20 years at least, until we have the uprising of the Zapatista army, the FZLN, where there is a clear understanding that the native peoples, they have a proposal of action, and in a way they declare war to the state to demand the compliance of their demands. This generated, of course, after the San Andres agreements. But before this, I believe that it is important to recognize uh, that what we lived in a very, what was very, very like a landmark moment was the 500 year anniversary of the Congress of America in 1992, where we see the vitality of the peoples, their organization, their existence, the, in a permanent, in an ongoing action, where these 500 years show that they have not been destroyed, they have not been eliminated, but they exist. And this affirmation of the existence of native peoples is very important. It is vital because after 500 years, it's considered that indigenous peoples, Afro-descendant peoples are present, they are here. And this also shows the possibility of finding paths of their own. And after this, of course, we have up to 2014, when in Chiapas there is a national congress also uh, that is called the Land Pastoral, which also redraws uh, fundamental elements that have to do with the defense of territory, of strategic resources like water, like land, biodiversity, all of the different resources in the world that are under dispute continuously. And this has to do with an echo that is taking place throughout the globe where we understand that territory is fundamental and indigenous peoples have maintained these territories, they have maintained the energy of nature. And this has been a mission of the native peoples. And now this is claimed as something fundamental in the lives of the peoples so i this is this is crucial to understand also the pope's encyclica that is called laudato si this was part of a broader search and a broader process and after 2014 well we arrived to the present 20 where we have reached a very 
conflictive and hard situation where native peoples are alive, are struggling to maintain their territories, they are aware of their history and their value. And so participating or in this dynamics, this long-term dynamics has been a permanent learning for me and a permanent revision of work with indigenous peoples, which, and in a way I have accompanied that, but I, of course I have also learned, revised, I have restructured my thought. And at the same time, uh, how the idea of how we can be uh, aligned with the demands and the needs of these peoples. This has been a very important search or quest. And also in the work that I have done for many years in Desmi, this Desmi has is the social and economic development of the indigenous Mexicans. This has been a platform created in 1969, a platform to discover different work methodologies and how this can also lead to the construction of an economy of their own. Economy of their own means that it is, means understanding a relationship with nature, a search for resources, nourishment and food, the distribution of food and resources, organized work, collective work, the idea of an economy that is linked to organization of peoples, to the issue of a political presence of native peoples and a need to acquire knowledge, a need to practice knowledge, organizational knowledge and relating between different peoples and groups and communities through different possibilities of intervening in the general development of society because it is not we don't want native peoples to be isolated we want them to be part of a social construction and we want them to be to be able to establish fair and just relationships with the market as well these as producers of coffee, as producers of cattle, as producers of corn and beans and different, as producers in different ways, they can establish relationships in a fair or just market. And so a different quests or searches stem from there in relation to relating to society both at the national and international level through alternative markets that are fundamental because it is not about the peoples having an isolated life and only living with their own resources but integrating to a broader society and this lately is very broad because their territories. We need to understand that their territories are crucial for development and for the advance of society at large. We are lucky, we have to say it, we are lucky and fortunate to live in areas of the country that are strategic for the development of the world because of a presence of biodiversity, water, territory, borders, rivers, hydroelectric dams, also the labor of population, of the population that is very hardworking and they have an intelligence where they also maintain um, relationships in terms of communications and new technologies. So all of this it makes the experience of labor and work very, very strong. And there are many different elements that we can highlight, elements that can enable us to discover what the key points are in this process. So this understanding of being in the world and for many years, it has enabled me to learn many, many things, to learn from their culture, 
to learn from the process itself, from the different methodologies, from the needs, their, their needs, and understanding that peoples are, the native peoples, they are subjects of their own processes. And they have proposals which they will uphold, they will maintain. So I would say that that is um, a, my contribution to this first part, to this first question. It has always, we have always thought of an idea of change. There is no idea of maintaining dependence or unchanging. The idea is to look for change and to transform reality in that search for change. And uh, then we go to the uh, part two. Um, both of you always uh, we define the economic life going beyond the nano sense of production and consumption. Could you elaborate more about the significance of life? in economy and also in technology. The issue that I identify here is understanding the question of economy. Now, with neoliberalism that has extended all over the globe, economy has become key has become central and i believe that it has become abusively key or central because the definition of economy itself um, makes the issue of scarcity as predominant or dominant and a scarcity that leads to suffering why do i say this we forget that in production there is much more than there's much more to production than material goods a good agricultural product or a good product from husbandry or, or cattle raising whatever product we are talking about entails a uh, in the best possible sense entails a, 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 a happiness as well or or a portion or some something related to happiness and good living but what makes this not completely satisfied is the fact that is the fact that there is a, a misunderstanding. There is like a deviation to understanding. In what sense do I mean this? Economy, economy entails beyond money itself. Economy entails a relationship, a relationship of balance between what is, what is offered or what is supplied and what is demanded. But good living, good living, or what we are calling good living, I, as I understand it, is based not so much on economy, but on the gift, the idea of gift, the idea of giving, just giving. Not because we are going to receive something, there is no exchange here, it's just the peasant who produces, produces to satisfy the needs that people have in terms of nourishment or, or, or food. If you put a price on everything and you make an economic factor intervene all the time, that's when I believe that we can say goodbye to good living. Good living is based on this idea of gift and giving. And of course, whoever can give, gives. The peasant gives his or her products. And those who receive are going to receive because they are human. 
they are human with hearts. That would be how I see the fundamental issue, particularly when we explore the idea of good living. The market mechanism is very expensive to maintain. And there is this situation where goods, consumption goods, are not going to be consumed by those who need them. For example, they need food, but because they are who can pay for them. So they are going to be consumed not by those who need them, but by those who can pay only. And that's why I consider that market and the economy are opposed to life. They are against life. That's what I say, at least. That is at least my understanding. That is the conclusion that I have reached in terms of, uh, in relation to the economy, that neo of course this is dominant neoliberalism and this is why i feel that we are living the situation that we are living scarcity climate change and all of this 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 need of turning everything into money through the market that is that is my understanding of this topic so maybe I could contribute so elements uh, in agreement with what you say, dear Jorge. Yes, please. I already said what I had to say about this question. I agree with you in the fact that um, the economy is a gift. It's uh, an important point of view. But I would like to just say that Economy has been central to my work in terms of organization in communities because in a way we have always been looking for an alternative to the relations, the production relations that have been established with the indigenous peoples because there has been a record, a history of exploitation of the labor force, of workers at the different fields, the big estates that produce uh, cattle, corn, coffee, and all of that. In those uh, places, indigenous peoples have been workers and many times they have been exploited because they have not received the proper uh, pay and remuneration. So the purpose was to transform the situation in the struggle over land in a way as to have people recover the land in many of the regions. Some communities have also defended their land, their territory, and they continue to keep their communal land. So this is key to economy. There wouldn't be uh, a possibility of, of living for them without this relationship with the land and the territory and all the, the goods that the land brings from the point of view of climate and as regards the different resources such as trees, the biodiversity, water, land itself, fertility and all of that. Then the other element of economy is peoples, the organized peoples and the work that they have always done they have always been producers they are producing millions of things they produce food but they also have to be acknowledged in terms of what the value of natural resources and also how they raise cattle and how they produce different assets that go into the market 
because they are part of um, a set, a group of other peoples that are permanently working on production. And then knowledge for production is key. The knowledge and the different wisdoms of uh, production systems, exchanges at local markets, all of that is involved in production in these regions. That is part of what the peoples do normally. This is not coming from abroad. The peoples exist and the peoples work, but there are systems, such as the neoliberal system, as you say, which try to create the conditions so that there is a process of accumulation of wealth and so that that accumulation does not end up benefiting the owners of the of the different resources that the owners of the of the technologies the transportation and how they control the market so economy as life means looking for an alternative to the system and this has been an ongoing process because some points are key for this vitality to to defend the territory it's important to have communities communities in their uh, awareness of belonging to this territory of being owners of that territory and uh, of being vital to be attentive to these pillaging processes. And then we have another element, which is collective work. In a way, they, there are different processes of production where what's important is collectiveness and the organization of work in collective terms. There's another important element in the people's economy, which is the collective ownership of the means of production so that they own the land collectively, they own machinery collectively, so that they can have better and more organized work. And also there are cooperatives to distribute production and for consumption. So this is a way of organizing work on the basis of the collective ownership of the means of production. Also, the acknowledgement of the vitality of, of the knowledge, the ancestral knowledge that go into producing things that, in a way, are not part of the market at the moment. For example, the knowledge on health, based on the relationship with nature and also the process of um, caring for animals and caring for trees and of having a harmonized relationship with nature. And the fact of being able to live and survive and in a way resist in those territories. This has been the purpose because health education housing and the development of communities come from there people are part of a broad process of communities and we can speak of societies that are alive because they keep all these elements alive but now the problem that you mentioned is very clear. The problem that this is within a context in which the elements of this economic, neoliberal economic system uh, have to do with this um, of turning everything into money, into commodities, into products, turning everything into goods for accumulation. And that 
destroys the possibility of having their own universe, which is still persisting, is still ongoing, because there are many struggles by the people to keep up with this way of living and also to, to live in a different way apart from the market in terms of the prices of the products and and in terms of uh, looking for profit on those products but contrary to that to have the uh, possibility of distributing goods equally and also maintaining the community, maintaining services and positions within the community. And this gift that we were talking about, because there are many things that are given as gifts or, or, or that are invested, right? They invest time, services, uh, emotions, solidarity. They give up a series of common goods. They look for the well-being of the whole community. They look for there to be a habitat for all of them. They look for protecting some of the fundamental regions or resources, for example, the sources of water or the forests. Nature would not be as alive if the peoples were not there, if they didn't exist, if they were not the key presence in territories. This is not a territory where the peoples are absent. Peoples, in a way, establish an interrelationship with the territory and they give life, they infuse life to the territories. But now there's an advancement towards uh, extracting these resources. And this is brutal because they are going for water, they are going for forests, they are going for mines, they are going for territories. And so the hydroelectric dams and all of this create a situation of danger for people. This is an ongoing danger because people are, in, are endangered and they are about to not have the possibility of living in their own terms. And there's a threat that through this model, um, peoples will not be able to exist. The existence of peoples is not an ideological existence. They exist because they work and they live as peoples, because they keep relationships as peoples because they have an autonomy in the sense of organizing themselves and in the sense of keeping up with the possibility of feeding themselves and reproducing for themselves this fertility for communities to exist is very interesting here in Chiapas the life of the peoples is very interesting because there's always kids and children. There's always new generations and vitality and young people. And that depends on the fact that peoples uh, uh, having the time uh, to uh, and, and the sense of life being that. Life is not only productive work but also is the meeting the encounter among people it's the celebration the possibility of of gift of giving things so in that sense I'm very much in agreement with you when we say life in economy it's not about economy it's about the gift the gift of life and this is still in existence. We can still say that people exist in this way, and that is part of their philosophy. It's not just a, a task that they perform. It's part of the philosophy of the peoples, being able to say we have abundance. 
We have abundance of goods. We have food we can share. We can celebrate. There's a life cycle to, to say, well, this is time to, to sow food. It's time to, to um, work the field. So in that sense, I think life is fundamental economic, in economic terms. You can speak of political economy, but what's clear is that what we have to say is just life, not economic life, but life, life in and of itself. Life is an economy that allows for there to be new generations for subsistence yeah and uh now we have a uh, part three uh we uh you stress the importance of historical identity how is it challenged by colonization modernization institutions of state ngos and multinational cooperations um, how do the indigenous peoples struggle to rebuild collectivities in the communities and recover and manage, and man, uh, um, manage the uh, commons? How do you see the ways the indigenous people build the interdependency between peoples and interdependency with nature? If you'd like, I can continue. Yes, of course. Since I was already touching on that topic, I can I can go on, I can pick up on, on what I was saying. The, the the topic of organization. Yes, of course, go ahead. So in this the, the historic view is important for peoples themselves. Usually, history can be seen as something that is real in the sense that it's not about just um, ancient elements, but it's about uh, present elements. So the historic question, the historic issue is about understanding the past, but understanding the past also as... Um, a more difficult past, a more harmful past, in the sense that the peoples have gone out of situations of marginalization and exploitation that were harder and harsher in terms of isolation and discrimination. So the past, the historic past, is very recent, but it also entails um ancient times because we could say that there are elements that come from from the conquest that come from denying the peoples of the imposition of the imposition of a way of life of a system of a culture over another the, the denial of the values the domination, the structural domination of the peoples and the, the killing of the peoples too. And a control of the empire of these people. So in that sense, the processes of independence has not changed the pyramid system in the sense that there's always um the, the peoples always end up in the bottom part of the pyramid so that is the logics of dependence and power over these peoples but this history can be very old but it can also be understood from the present very recently a couple of years ago peoples were linked to crops, for example, or to isolation or to this sense of inferiority. But there has been a change due to a whole series of worldwide 
phenomenon where people have recovered the sense of right, the right to exist as people, the right on their language, the right of participating and their organizational capacity to face the system and in a way create their own conditions. So this has been a very important struggle because from that struggle, people increasingly understand the global context. It's not just about the relationship between one uh, worker and one owner or between one trader and, uh, and the buyer, but that relationship that was very close and very local now you understand it from a global point of view. It's part of broader relationships and workers are not only linked to, um, to the state owners, they are also linked to a global situation because they participate as buyers or as producer as producers in a broader system where financial issues and international issues are the norm where they have to understand the power structures and they have to understand legal issues which is something that's important for because latin american peoples are always in an unbalanced, unequal situation in the face of the multinational companies and in the face of the structure of financial capital. So peoples, in a way, they continue to, with the search within a global entity, but also strengthening their processes. One of them has to do with the existence of autonomy as a quest for self-determination of the peoples. And so that the rights of peoples can be effective. This cannot be achieved without the, polit the, the process of politicization because this is not only about an economic issue, but also the search for relating and interrelating with other groups and to create consensus for their defense of their rights, for the defense of their resources, their land, and their right to participate in the uh, in, in, in the country's politics. So it is very important to see how the groups generate this dynamics of being part of a nation and of being present and showing their interests and their objectives. The, it is the, it is very the, the 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 struggle for the rights of the indigenous peoples is very important but in mexico this exists as a general understanding we have 68 languages present in our country and in a way they have become aware of the need to relate to each other to form relationships and links there we have the Indig indigenous national congress which is an alternative not from the government by the government but it is an initiative of the groups themselves to work on how the groups are all over the territory and what are the places where which resist and those places that resist are where we have strategic resources that are necessary for the development of capital. So the, those, those groups that are resisting are the ones who hold the territories with these natural, nat natural resources. So the National Indigenous Congress gives you the possibility, gives them the possibility of communicating, of creating resources of their own, of having lawyers to defend them and maintaining the spirit of self-determination of groups. So in that sense, 
interdependence or collaboration among groups is vital. It is crucial. It is no longer possible anymore for a community, a native community, to remain isolated. I understand this very well. For example, what Amazonian people groups are saying, in a way, it seems that these were isolated groups from the world, but now they are in the center of the world, in the sense of the resources that exist on their land in the Amazon. And this also happens in Mexico, because Mexico is a corridor, a huge corridor of towards the United States, and, and this vitality is present. But in a way, if the capacity of peoples didn't, uh, of being alert to this dynamic didn't exist, well, then they couldn't defend themselves. So I believe, I believe that the fact, the issue of community is very important because, and we need to understand community as something that is dynamic. It is not only about community uh, understood in an in an old anthropological sense in the way that a community can be a place uh, that reproduces its own its own place its own com its own uh, rites or rituals ways of life but we have to understand community in contrast as something dynamic where there is an identity that is maintained within a dynamic, a dynamic idea of identity. This is where I see the groups in Mexico that belong to the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, where we have a seismic corridor where there will be some dams that will be placed. I'm sorry, not dams, some companies and businesses of industrial production, the native peoples that live in this area, in this isthmus of Tehuantepec, they very clearly understand what this uh, project, economic project, is going to entail. And while they do not uh, remain in a single community, they are a more dispersed or spread out community that defends their in interests and they defend their existence and the need to respect their decisions within a territory that becomes a threat for international exchange or international trade and industrial production and also for the border of Mexico. So we see that the conditions of the world today put native peoples at a need to maintain themselves alive, but in a new different dynamics, not in the old way or in the old sense. Rather, the dynamics today refers to societies that have identity, that have rights, and that have the possibility of maintaining themselves vis-a-vis -a, -vis a system. That's how I saw this question, the number three question related to collectives and collectivity. In a way, it is important to recognize that in these processes, there, there is a, also an aspect related to minorities. We cannot talk about all the groups, all the members of a community with the same uh, consciousness or awareness. There are minorities. Minorities are basic. Minorities are the ones who are in the vanguard of the strategy, of thinking, of quests, of resistance. But there are many groups that participate and are involved in the system and they benefit also from the system and they are also involved in the construction of the system and they are not able to move on to the idea of the construction and defense for themselves on their own. So there will be divisions among the different groups, some of them who move more towards the established control, 
the dynamics of the system itself and others, other groups that have the possibility of maintaining a dynamics of resistance and alternative searches and a construction of their own, which is crucial because they can do their self-government, they can create community governments, they can maintain a clear consciousness of their identity as Native peoples and their rights to be respected as groups vis-a-vis -a, -vis a permanent threat of destruction and of a system where they become uh, merchandise, commercial goods in the context of the, for example, the need for labor in global production. That's what I have to say. I don't know if you want to tell us uh, your thoughts. That is, that was excellent, Jorge. <laughs> I don't think I have anything more to add in relation to this point. I feel, I feel that this mensch, I would just like to mention that this is not uh, an economic issue. Economy has to do with material aspects, not with these situations. I don't know if we can call them maybe spiritual, or I would prefer maybe. I would, I would like uh, for them not to be confused, but I, I think that it has to do with this. It is invisible, but these aspects become apparent not as individuals, but as collectives, vital collectives, living collectives. Not divided as we think in this modern understanding of society. It is completely vital. I think that this is the topic uh, upon which we should insist the most. I think we need to develop this much more and we need to write about this. I think Jorge, it would be great if you could if you could share this, this these ideas. Yes, it is very important. It's what Lao Kimchi was just saying. Trying to show the vitality of processes at the organizational level. The autonomous municipalities, for example, the issue of how there has been an exercise of nonviolence facing violence, because the problem is not simple at all. There is violence. There are structures that are very strong, for example, in certain regions, there is militarization, there is organized crime, there are power structures that in a way maintain their interests for extraction, mining extraction, for example. We have groups from countries like Canada, for example, that have a strategy for mining all over the world and how these peoples, these native groups are going to defend this situation and how they are going to consider that they have the right to decide regarding their own territory and that they are the owners of this territory. There cannot be a foreign appropriation like a permanent conquest and a permanent denial of the existence of these peoples. So that is the key point, right? That is the key point of this political issue of the native groups, the political development, being subjects. This is crucial in order to maintain their own forms of production, their own forms of health, and 
this is at the center, we can say, of some of the intentions of the struggle of these people, of these groups, and also the possibility of recovering their historic understanding of ancestrality, what, what they have been as groups before, how they have been able to maintain and to resist to maintain what is essential in their cultures. Maybe we could go into question number four with this, but I don't know if you want to mention anything in related to Cosmo visions. Yes, I believe that what you are saying is very important because in the end, these groups are not owners of the territory. The owners of the territory are the territories themselves. We occupy them, we, are, we inhabit them, but we do not, they are not our property, right? It's just the contrary. We, we are in charge of maintaining their vitality and their organi organicity or organ of the territory. We are in charge of giving the territory life, caring for it, taking care of it. That, that is what we, that is our work, or that is the work of the collectives. Margaret. Yes, I hmm. think that this this is the key factor. Jorge, thank you very much for the clarifications that you just made. It was great. Yeah. Um, uh, Jorge in Shinshawa, uh, you just mentioned uh, this is our collective work to bring life to a territory. Uh, could you explain more in uh, your context? Yes. What is happening to us is that this vitality of the territory that also depends on the collectives and the groups that are there that occupy it. This is something that is not considered that is not considered when we when people see the territory it is seen from the point of view of economics for, of of this cheap economics neoliberal econo economy um people do not see the invisible factors the non-material factors rather and that are as important or even more important in their lives than the material aspects they are at least as important as the material aspects. And so what Jorge, my colleague just mentioned, and his clarification I believe is crucial in order to continue down this path. I, I had a, like a problem because I was trying, I have been trying to understand for a long time the issue of what a community actually means. What is a community? What is a community? Like a contrast in relation to what a society means. But I believe that how you have presented it, the community is what gives vitality to a society or to a nation. And that doesn't make it a competitor of any other one. It has to do with being a part of, it has to do with being life. So thank you very much, Jorge, for your, for your contribution. I thought it was extraordinary. It was wonderful. Thank you. What I do feel, what I do think about is what identity is. Maybe I could uh, contribute some elements for the question number four. Now, that has to do with indigenous cosmologies or cosmogonies in the sense 
that they are not something old. They are present. They are contemporary. Sometimes when we talk about, or sometimes when we say that indigenous peoples have a knowledge and thinking or thought of their own, we can say that this was something that was present a long time ago with the elders and that has been um, there has been a process of it uh, being lost but what i consider i i feel that the bodies the existence of bodies the existence of our our capacity of being in terms of being in the universe of being in time of being in space and the practice of living, of coexisting in a society, the practice of distributing goods, of learning from others, of, a, of the practice of a community ethics in the sense of respect. And respect, not only in the sense of I know who you are, but in the sense that I recognize, I acknowledge what you are. And all of this within a society that we are all a part of and where we consider the value of the existence of the other. And so respecting people, respecting the, their ancestral nature, respect and, and, their, and, and respecting the elders as well as the children, the existence of life in this sense, respect is crucial because respect also entails respect to life and respect to nature. And in a way, this explains the relationship with nature and the un their understanding of nature, the transitory nature, how nature passes, how nature has cycles and it is ongoing and people also pass and have cycles and we shouldn't fear our passing. There is a continuity of life and there is also a transcendence, recognizing the transcendence of and the presence of the dead, the presence of life after death. This also entails not despairing because there were there, we will always have uh, awareness that there is an afterlife and also that our life is not permanent. What you were talking about before in relation to care, what, what are we owners of? If we only live, if we only exist, we are not owners. We only exist in this world. And the universe is very broad. Other one of the cosmological elements, at least I feel that it is a permanent element in the lives of people, has to do with being open. Space is open. The sky is huge. Mountains are huge. The valleys are huge. The rivers, everything is grandiose. And if we only think about the fact that we are the owners of something well maybe we can be the owners of an apartment of a house of a very small territory but we are not owners we belong to this universe we belong to this we are a part of this and so we are living in a very broad very big context because it includes the stars the moon the sun this is all part a part of us and we are part of that and we receive this energy and we live it we not only receive it it is vital to us the existence of these energies of nature because that is what we feed on and food itself are a product of all this process we see this it is a matter it is a very, how to say it, we see this very clearly. We see how plants grow. We sow corn and then it grows and then we harvest it and it becomes food. And this has depended on the rain. It has depended on the wind and the sun. It has relied on time and time as a need as well, as a necessity, the fact that time exists. We do not cut its meaning time exists and we live in time and we 
expect and hope for time and we have the capacity of waiting for things to happen because we are part of a continuity we cannot ask a child to be an adult the child has to grow has to learn and has to take on a series of responsibilities as he or she grows and says, I am capable of being an authority in this group because I have learned all these different processes. So this idea, this idea of cosmologies, I do not see it as knowledge, but as practices, uh, as a constitution, the person throughout their life is able to constitute a certain knowledge through the person's acts the person constitutes an authority and acquires respect and respects and is part of the society in a meaningful way because the person has grown within this dynamics not outside it And so here we see elements where there are certain norms that are established or certain ways of living that are established because these are practiced through um, dances, through cult, through music, through um, parties and celebrations. So it's a sort of renovation here in Mexico, there's a type of ceremony that where people jump off a big, big tree that is a sort of a, a very tall uh, pole. And then they, they dance on top of that pole and they they dance for uh, point to the different um, cardinal points and then they jump off and, and they and they um, turn around the pole and this is called voladores de papanta this shows that the people have the very broad perspective and vision a universal vision and kids children also participate so Old people also do this without any fear. They learn to go out of that sort of fear in the face of nature and they end up uh, flying around, right, in this universe. So this is part of the possibility that peoples have when they are open-minded, when they, they are open and this is not a closed world, it's an open world. And now we see this more clearly because no one is thinking of closing off these communities. They are thinking of opening up. And so they are open to what other sciences teach. Because what does the what does biodiversity mean what does medicine mean what does technology mean what does digital communication mean all of that is opened up and opened up and then but but they use their own bodies their own being as the basis and i think the young people are also fundamental because being linked to the current times the dynamic lives they have not lost their identity and also the demand for transformation is very strong on them this implies a change in the relationship between men and women so women have the possibility of also thriving and developing their own potential but I call this cosmology as well. This is not only about Quetzalcoatl cosmology, for example, or, or it's not only about the myths and the ancestral knowledge. It's also about the current issues, which are still relevant and that are celebrated. When you go to different 
spaces where people are vital and alive, they live this way. It's not that they live isolated. They live in that rhythm of life. This is a rhythm. It's a way of living that entails an awareness of the fact that they, it's possible to live this way and not necessarily being trapped by the dynamics of development or the dynamics of productivity or of economy right exactly the dynamics of economy which of course is not dynamic economy is not dynamic really it's static it's stable absolutely I think your approach is vital, your approach to what we call cosmovision or cosmology. It's not only a, a discourse, right? A speech, it's, it's the picture of a practice, right? It's seeing a practice of life. Life in these communities yes and also they express this because I think that in when we speak about their own languages for example Aymara or Quechua this thing about the music right this is a recreation a permanent recreation that they have uh thought they want to recover their own rhythm their own musicality and the, the 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 celebration itself and also the way of expressing not not only about singing but also about the bodily expression the fact that they show themselves as identities that are dressed up with the, their own uh, suits with their own colors and and drawings and designs in a way this, uh, is to say, well, the peoples are there, are there. This is uh, a representation, right, of the peoples. They they sort of uh, disrupt or the scene because it seems as if they had been disappeared and now they uh, they are inserted in society and they are here to demand and to claim for the rights and they are proud of that they are proud of their identity because before they were hidden or they were denied so they were ashamed they didn't want to be indigenous peoples they didn't want to show their indigenous identity they hid it so in a way they uh simulated being someone else but now they are erupting i'm i'm thinking of bolivia of the cholitas the, the the women who sing and dance and um attract people because it's a sort of a mixed uh community but or a mixed race but actually it's an indigenous identity and also governments sometimes take advantage of that that they want to strengthen cultural issues in terms of folk issues but peoples maintain the, their identity because they resist they want to show their lives through these expressions so I see that we are going through a novel a novel phase this is a novelty that's right. Uh, because the um, uh, Mano has raised his question first, so uh, uh, please, uh, I would like to invite Mano to uh, answer his question and then uh, Victor to express his uh, comments. So uh, Mano, could you uh, turn on your camera? Thank you. Yeah, please. It was a great discussion, really. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. You know, in this session, several key concepts uh, were fundamentally redefined community, production, economy, territory. Uh, you know, it was really uh, very, very enlightening and 
These are new theoretical tools for our struggle. Uh, my question is uh, about uh, the very important formulation about territories. Uh, territories have their own life. Uh, humans and others are occupants. Uh, and then, uh, therefore, how to establish uh, a new uh, practice, new discourse, new policy, and, a, uh, and uh, advance this movement to recognize uh, the life of territories, uh, life and right, right to life of the territories themselves. Because capital has treated land as a factor of production. Territory is a commodity. And in neoliberal uh, era, uh, it has been not only a, a commodity, a commodity with multiple uses when technology and uh, you know the present silicon era technology, uh, AI and all that is added. Uh, territory has far extended <clears throat> meaning. Therefore, how do we proceed without struggle to establish the life of territories? This is my question. Thank you. Jorge San Diego and Jorge Ishishawa, maybe uh, you respond to this question first. I would like to say that this question posed by Mano is very important because this is a key point of the struggle of the peoples. It's defending the territories, but it's also the key point of the of the pillaging of the territory, that is how there are interests over the territory and, and people who are trying to uh, take up those territories. And in that appropriation, there's a logics of pillaging, of destroying, because this is about um, taking advantage of the resources of those territories. So when we say that there's a need to defend the territory, we mean that the, this should be a defense, not in the same sense of appropriating to, to take advantage of resources, but actually to maintain the life of the territories, to, to care for the territory, to have a different logics of care of territory. So the the new politics, the new policies uh, would mean that we are part of the universe. We are part of those territories. And our relationship is to care and to respect for those territories. As indigenous peoples speak of the mother earth, of the Pachamama, they, they say that the, this is about finding respect for our mother earth because mother earth provides us with everything we have land food life mother earth sustains and, and supports our whole existence so politics is not about only defending the territories but it's also about understanding territories understanding the need to respect the territory and to understand our role our position we are not owners of those territories we do not have the right to uh, take advantage of this, those territories we are the ones who have to seek for a way to care for those territories and protect them and to protect ourselves with those territories because we live off of that land, we, we exist in that land and that territory, and we are in that territory. So this is uh, a struggle in the face of commodities. It's a, it's a struggle in the face of the fact that the land will become a commodity. And this is a frontal struggle, a battle, because there are no other options the system will leave us with no other options this is part of the its dynamics this issue of commodities but at least at the moment there is the the, the intelligence of us being in the territories 
we have that intelligence and our mission is to care for those surges. This is not ours. We are not owners. We are inhabitants of those territories. I completely agree with Jorge. But the issue that we are discussing here is how to produce, how to create that change effectively. We speak of the Mother Earth, yes, but we have corporations, international companies there. They, they are hurting territories. They are harming territories. Mining is completely crazy how it's been uh, implemented. And this is being resisted by the peoples because it is uh, pushing away the populations that are inhabiting those territories. So they are expropriating the land, the territories of its life. So it, it's not just um, a legal issue, right? It's much more deep than that. It's deeper than that. It's a spiritual issue, yeah. if we could say that. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, Bidget. and uh, yeah, Bidget so. has a uh, question, right? Yeah, yeah just a pen. Thank you. The so. camera to you, uh, please. Yeah, you know, it's very interesting discussion, as Mona pointed out. My question is, you talked about, uh, you know, co indigenous cosmology, very interesting point. But does it differ by sex in the sense the women cos indigenous cosmology is different than that of the men or their same? Thank you. The, uh, yes, I would like to to answer that question in the sense that according to what I learned is that there is a duality. I mean, there are men and there are women, but now we have a broader diversity in terms of gender, but throughout the history of the peoples, the duality is very important. The duality is there because there is a difference. And because we cannot say that there's the same uh, location or, or position for the both genders. So for women, I believe that there's a whole dynamics that is completely different. And that has to do with fertility. It has to do with being the creators, right? The, the, the ones who... Um, who create children and humanity, the, the maternal womb and, and this whole process of, of gestation and, and their linkage with seeds and the idea of caring for seeds and the work for caring for children and for the homes and their authority in terms of of managing the family relations. So women are a pillar, are, are a different pillar to the pillar uh, of men. And they, uh, the men are linked to what is outside of the homes, but this is part of uh, this mutual agreement. There's a need of an agreement between both genders. Thus, um here in our peoples uh what they say is that you have to convince women first because women will be leading all these processes if you convince only men well there will be a problem you you have to actually uh, have a discussion with the women who are the ones who have the vision of life they have the vision of life in the community so I couldn't really comment on that because I don't have that much experience on this, but I do have respect of this. Women have, have, are the fundamental 
foundation of the community and they have clear distinctive elements such as fertility, gestation, the care for children, uh, the care for food, the households, they have family authority. And so in a way, they are respected by the communities. So that cosmology uh, has to do with the fact that there's an understanding that there's an idea relates to the sun and the moon. The, the moon uh, belongs to women in a way because women are the ones who, who point to the life cycles. That is, uh, the, the fact that there is um, vital cycles that uh, are related to the moon, well, they also are related to, to women. So that would be my comment. Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, then uh, Victor Hugo, please. First of all, I would like to greet the presenters for the depth of their analysis and their the breadth of uh, such a problematic, such a complex problematic as can be the understanding of indigenous cosmologies and their ways of life. From my experience in Ecuador, as a member of the Commission for the Defense of Human Rights, which is a non-governmental organization that has accompanied organizations, indigenous organizations, for many years now in their rights claims and the claims regarding their ways of life, I would like to just, I would like to highlight two things. First of all, I'd like to remind you that as a worldview, indigenous worldview, it is a challenge for those of us who understand from Western worldviews, liberal worldviews. I'd like to remind you that one of the symbolic representations of indigenous peoples, particularly from the Andean region, is the chakana, is, is the cross with a Greek form, with a Greek shape, but has the particularity of showing, of indicating the union between the north and the south, the union between the cosmic community and the human community. There is a balance between the day and the night, a balance between women and men, a balance between matter and spirit. So there is a complexity that is symbolized in that cross, in the chakana, and this enables us to use this as a guide to understand indigenous thought uh, for those of us who do not belong to those ethnic groups. I would also like to remind you that in this identity claim of an anti-colonial position, remembering the catastrophe of the Spanish invasion, Latin America, at some point it was known as America, then it was known as Latin America, and now it is known as Abya Yala, the mother land, the land of life, with it, which is the or, it originates in the Kuna people of Panama. So these continental symbologies are demanding of us to understand in a different way indigenous thought in its generality and in its particularity. Yeah. I would like to highlight yeah. that we need to be very tuned, fine-tuned into what, or and very attentive of diversity. We have, we mentioned that in Mexico, there were 68 languages. In Ecuador, we have 14 indigenous languages. So in such a small country, we have such a large diversity and this, invites us to understand their communitarian way of life from one province and one region to another. The organization, the community organization is not the same along the Andes mountain range than in the Amazon area. The coexistence of people with nature is not the same where there are rivers that are 200 or 300 meters wide than that there where we have like small rivers coming down from the Andes Mountains. So the connection with water cannot be generalized. Each group has their identity. 
in relation to each one of these resources, even the notion of resources is a um, Western commercial concept or understanding. So this is, uh, uh, nature is part of the human being, nature is live matter. And this is an understanding and a lesson that we need to learn to configure in our day-to-day -day understandings. I would like to highlight something that was mentioned. The relationship with a market is not necessarily a relationship uh, that is destructive. In large part, it is, or to a large extent it is, but not completely. If not, the people, if the native peoples had not been able to use the market for their own ways of production, for their own commercial ideas, they wouldn't have been able to survive. They have ideas of barter. There are regions where there is an exchange through barter of products and there is no exchange of money, of currency. There is a notion of market there that we need to go back to, we need to think about. And also we need to pay attention to the main challenge today that has to do with the migration of youth from the rural areas to urban centers. I think this is something that is general to all different countries, that is widespread. There is, the, there is an absence of the state to uh, uh, foster peasant indigenous agricultural production, so young people have no longer any uh, job prospects, and at the same time, there is a paradox. When you foster Western education, well, then the future is given through the access to modern professions, engineering, medicine, Western medicine, economy, etc. Where do these young people find jobs? They find them in the cities. They cannot stay in the country, in the rural areas anymore. Even to finish their university studies, they need to leave the rural areas to go to the city because they only have up to primary and secondary education in the rural areas where their communities live. So we need to combine the challenge of development in a Western sense with what the indigenous peoples understand about maintaining life in their territories, including the notion of territory that is so geographic from a Western point of view, we need to change it. We need to understand territory from an indigenous point of view. Territory for indigenous peoples is a complex, very complex unit. So we have, we face huge challenges that go beyond resistance and refer to participation in political administration, in public administration. Indigenous peoples, at least in Ecuador, are no longer in a static situation demanding help from the state. They now have their own representations, their own political representation to participate in electoral processes and to access, to access positions as authorities, as in provinces, in municipalities, as Congress people in the Congress, or as participants in the parliament, in the National Assembly. So this particip political participation transcends the uh, two anthropological understanding of indigenous peoples. Community life is not a fate uh, in which peoples must remain when you have the invasion of the Western market, everything is being commercialized. So the defense of the territory is defense of natural resources. It is also the defense of biodiversity. In Ecuador, we have this paradox where in some places of the Amazon, there we have uncontacted groups or tribes that have isolated in a volunteer way are they in, they have had the the will to isolate themselves and it is not feasible to integrate them into the market this has demanded that within indigenous indigenous mobilization that takes place since the 90s here we have been able to in to include within the Republic's constitution when it was approved in 2008, a series 
of demands, a series of claims that are now part of our policies, starting with the recognition of two indigenous languages as official languages, apart from Spanish, we call it Castellano here, not Spanish. So apart from the Castellano, we have the Shuar and the Quichua as official languages. These are recognized in the constitution. Territories, indigenous territories have also been recognized and included in order to carry out mining or oil related um, endeavors. They, communities have to give their prior free and informed consent. And this is a political struggle because of course the liberal state favors the interests of transnational companies, of mining and oil companies. And they want that consult consultation to be just something very simple and say that everybody is going to win. This is a win-win situation. This has caused that in some groups, once the investments have taken place, a part of the community defends its integrity and another part of the community has been has been uh, taken, uh, co-opted, and have jobs uh, from the companies or for the companies. So this, there are schools, there are health centers, hospitals, et cetera, that have been that have been fostered by the companies themselves. This creates internal confrontation where a part of the community accepts the entrance of these companies, mining and oil companies, and another part that resists them. This is a tremendous challenge for some regions in the Amazon in Ecuador. It is also important to highlight in what has been mentioned here, a different aspect, another aspect that seems very important. It has to do with the presence of women. I know communities where those who have the administrative power in communities are women. And in many parts, the feminist activists that do that create awareness in this sense have sometimes been very surprised because they there are places that are already applying things that are very difficult to apply in uh, some western urban areas for example they have to do with women's role participation and exercise of women's rights so I think it's important to take into account the relationship between the material and spiritual relations, which is not only a confrontation with the market. Here in Ecuador, we have the Otavalo indigenous group that produces uh, cloths, ponchos, a series of textiles that used to sell them in the cities outside Otavalo, which is a province in the north of Ecuador. It's a small canton. They went to the large cities and then they went abroad. So there are artisans, crafts, workers from Otavalo who are selling their products in Tokyo, in Paris, in Madrid. There is even a delegation that traveled to Shanghai. And how do they do that? How do they import? How do they get the knowledge? How are they informed about the knowledge to export? So there is a combination of materials that they have to take via vessel and others via aircraft. And you are amazed, completely amazed at how these indigenous peoples know better than any economist the movement of foreign trade in order to allocate their artisanal products. And now we are amidst this, cha this challenge of using foreign trade market to export agricultural products. There are about four agricultural products apart from flowers and other foods that are exported to Spain. So we do not necessarily have to have a very negative idea of the relationship with the market. This is a permanent struggle. We are damned. The market is going to be eternal. There always was. But now with an exploitative interpretation, the market now has a negative connotation, of course, but it is also necessary to defend identity, to defend languages. We, in Ecuador, we have bilingual schools. We need each territory 
to respect the language and have bilingual education. And this makes us paradoxically to have indigenous children that are that have a better education than white or mestizo children because they are trilingual. They speak Quechua or Shuar, they speak Spanish, and then they also speak English because it's compulsory to learn English in schools. So we have also these paradoxes, children that are trilingual. And I would like to end by calling your attention to the issue of political participation for public management. If we do not achieve this, we are just subjects of incident. If we are not, sorry, subjects that can in, that can influence these public policies to preserve identity, to preserve culture, to preserve resources against depredation, against devastation by mining, oil, exporting, exploiting, timber exploiting companies, then we are only going to stay at the level of discourse, of narratives. We have to be protagonists of new political formulations and also for the conformation of cooperatives that can rationally use these resources for self-consumption or for their sale in the marketplace. That is my suggestion. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, I was also about to ask the question about uh, ownership of the territory, because um, when you when you were saying that uh, nobody should be able to own something, own the territory, and then the territory is itself the owner, and we are only in charge, or the humans are only in charge of giving the territory life and being its guardian. And I think that is a very um, maybe novel, uh, uh, idea for those who are so accustomed to uh, speculations of housing, of estates, of developers. And so this very fundamental idea about um, the relationship of humans to the to nature or to the to their environment, uh, to what we are kept, we can have access to, I think this is something very uh, fundamental and maybe um, not so easily accepted. Uh, uh, but then there's another question, actually, I would want to go into, because I think just now um, uh, San Diego already spoke, um, uh, elaborated the idea about the territory. So what I would like to bring up is uh, what um, Ishizawa uh, mentioned. You said uh, in your speech, that it is, uh, we shouldn't have exchange. We have gift. It is a giving economy. So um, I think this must also be sounding so strange to people, because we are we are uh, in the in the market uh, in the kind of market we talk about exchange. And if you talk about fair trade, you are already progressive enough. <laughs> You're supposed to be progressive enough if you talk about fair trade. So that, so everything is based on the idea of exchange. So we even have uh, ideas like when you say giving should be the prominent one when and the giving is for a well, while when we produce, we produce for the, those in need. That is the things we need. So I think of one example. Now, uh, if we think of a very immediate example of giving, without thinking of exchange, it should be the parents milking or feeding the child. But then in the capitalistic kind of ideology, a, a, a mother uh, feeding the child uh, and with every spoon that she's feeding the child, she would be thinking of an investment that she would be investing into a future when she would be have this exchange of care from the child. So our minds are, are now so very contaminated by all this ideology about the market, especially that of the capitalist market and of the neoliberal uh, uh, paradigms. So could you say something more about the giving, the, the uh, giving and maybe it's, a gift economy, or could you give some examples of such experiences uh, in the practice of the uh, indigenous communities? Jorge Ishizawa, please. Uh, 
I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I was speaking in English. So I've given a very scandalous term, maybe, but I believe that deep down, what is what is truly wrong? I mean, in the sense of establishing a relation of, of conflict, not all transactions in the market are easy. There has to be a, a whole infrastructure of governments that have to lay down the fair prices, etc. So the thing is that what my colleague Jorge was saying about um, giving and receiving, well, that requires a mutual relation that does not depend on ownership that is an absolute uh, appropriation because because all productions are done with multiple interventions of multiple agents so in agriculture, this is very clear. Without rain, without climate, without soil, you couldn't do that. So what's the uh, retribution? What do you give the, the soil, the territory, so that it can produce? And at the same time, it remains alive. Scientific production or scientific agriculture does not address this issue at all. So what I wanted to convey in my presentation was to uh, explain a bit about the factors that have to do with spiritual issues that that are part of the communities of human beings so that is a topic that I'm very concerned about in these times to understand that and what can we do to support the value of that spirituality in the communities which is being lost at the at the world markets that we know it's true that the market is part of a reality as victor hugo was saying it can be useful it's not necessarily perverse but the relation with the indigenous communities and the market, well, yes, that is a perverse relationship. We see that in agriculture. And that in, it's not just about uh, treating the population, how the population is treated. It's about how the nature is treated. It's a perverse engagement with the world. Is there a way to make this market not perverse? I'm sure there is, but that requires a very particular community spirit. So anyway, uh, that is what I can say. I don't have any further arguments to give. It's just to say that I think this has to do with community and with humanity uh, within a context of a universe that is not are ours to take and we are part of the universe i i would like to comment something in relation with the questions that were asked 
or actually in relation with the comments that were made. I think those were, comments were very important. So I thank you for them. And I think Ecuador's experience is extremely important in the struggles of indigenous peoples. With regard to the issue of territory and the issue of the gift, I think there are two contradictions or two elements that are contradictory that can be transformed. And the struggle is for transforming those. One has to do with between the gift and the commodity and the other has to do with ownership and care. In the case of commodities and gifts, well, in a way we are speaking of the same elements. We have corn, for example, and we can turn that into a commodity or or in a gift. So we don't change the essence of the corn or of the bean. We, we change the relationship that we establish with that uh, food. If we produce goods for the community to support itself, well, we are producing goods in the sense that there are many things that we can do as human beings. Agriculture is science it, it's, a, it's like science people produce science as a commodity sometimes and people produce science as a gift sometimes there many people uh give the life or the, the time to science it could be a sort of gift to humanity or it could be thought of as a trade or a commercial exchange this does not change the object of what we are speaking about but actually it's about a change in the relationship we have that, with that object so when communities establish that their life is related to producing goods as gifts for the society well then they are not necessarily saying that those things do not have any value but actually they have value in terms of sustaining and supporting the community. And that could be uh, something that does not depend on a specific price or a specific profit. And society does the same thing. It, it is producing goods for well-being of people. So it could also be about um, authority, how you are part of a community uh, when you are an educator, for example, people who are not producing food precisely, but they are producing awareness and this is produced uh, freely. This does not have a price. The work is just the possibility of giving up something for the new generation. So the communities exercise this a lot. There are authorities to who do not receive any payments, community teachers that do not receive any payments, uh, leaders who um, give their lives without receiving any wages. They are not in a, in a commodity relationship. They are in a service relationship. And that is what spirituality is. It's a search for um, having life not as a service, but actually... Or it is a service and not a way of acquiring profit. And the same goes for territory and care. If you take into account, uh, if you take territory as a commodity, you will take the most profit that you can. You will send, sell stones, trees, water, everything. But if you take it from the perspective of the fact that it, this should be cared for, you will not sell it. You will care for water, for trees, for the water sources. Why? Because the relationship is different. So that contradiction is what is we need to go back to, to, to see the need for care. The care in the sense that through care, there's abundance and through abundance we do not need to take ownership of that territory anymore because we are living out of that 
territory. We are part of that and we are there with vitality. And it's it's like caring for air. We will not take ownership of air. We cannot own air, but we can care for air. We can produce oxygen and create the conditions so that the air is clean. And that is not for anyone to take. It's just to create life conditions for everyone. There can be many scientific efforts devoted to the care of nature and the care of the universe. And that is what leads to a sort of ethics. Those are the values that Margot spoke about. How we should understand our life. Our life is just that. It's two elements. One of them is service and the other one is care and we add to that respect and we can say that those ethic elements allow us to live in a different way in this society that is all about uh, profit and appropriation so I think that this is not um, in the ether it's real it's possible it's a practice of the peoples now we will have the uh, final uh, part and uh, the answer is um what and how do you think we can learn from indigenous well will cosmology or practice in order to deal with the problems of modernity and uh I read uh, Ish, uh, Jorge Ishishawa paper um, entitled On the Indigenous Understanding of the Climate Crisis in the, in the Central Andes. Um, you, say, you said that the um, recognizing the generalized loss of respect is a global phenomenon. They uh, that, uh, refer to the Andean peasant nurtures of biodiversity own their part of it. They feel part of the estrangement of the human species from the living earth and the urgency of recovering the ability to, quote, think like a mountain and, quote, feel like the earth. So uh, could uh, Jorge Ishizawa explain more and respond to this? This question how can we learn from indigenous cosmology thank you i don't know <laughs> i don't know how we can uh, the thing is uh, uh, the learning you have to do through practice that's following the the example of uh, people in the andes is uh, peasant nurtures of biodiversity have been very um, helpful for me in, uh, their their teachings uh, not through conferences but uh, in action uh, in their own farms and following with uh, uh, conversations and and that that's that's how uh, one can understand this i think because you see in practice what how they are living these uh, these ideas it's it's not uh, something like i did of uh, trying to give words to the expression it's not about just living in that situation directly. I think that's the issue. I don't, I don't know what I can add to to that question. And uh, maybe um, uh, Jorge San Diego, could you also respond to the uh, last question? Yes, I think that as we have said, 
the key point of learning of the cosmovision and cosmology and practice of indigenous peoples is about this that we have been discussing of the universe, the idea of positioning ourselves in the universe, in the totality, in the fact that we are not isolated, that we are part of something, that we have a responsibility in that sense, that we interact that we engage with one another that we constitute ourselves in the fact itself of being in the universe that all existing elements cooperate and make us be part of this we are a body and we are a, a spiritual part of this universe and actually we are permanently permanently in in development and that depends on the time on time we become part of this totality over time as we engage with with different things in community life in in relating to one another we develop so this infinite efforts to to be in, in a relationship with things, with nature, with life and with others, well, that makes us persons and people exist and we exist in this diversity. We are not the same or equal in all senses. We have a different location or position. We have a different history and identity. We have a, a, an ethnic identity and we have a, an, our own conflict but because we are faced with permanent challenge challenges and these challenges allow us for exercising our sense of organization and mobilization and, and struggle so that is very clearly reflected in our way of naming things right our language our main language and our uh, mental capacity of perceiving life and things and people have done this for many centuries and millennia they have constructed or built their own ways of looking at life or seeing life and they express this in their languages languages are fundamental to, to acknowledge the value of each language and the way in which they perceive and see reality and and the future is very important and it's part of that language also the design of things the design of agriculture of houses of the dresses of the dances of the society itself, those designs are important. It's important to acknowledge them and study them to see the depthness of of in and this identities and also social organization. Social organization is a key point to value the strength of the peoples. This insurgence of the peoples um happens because there is a uh, capacity of exchange of commitment of respect that sometimes are not uh in in written form but it, they are clear because there are respected commitments between peoples so the other element that we were discussing before is the role of women, right? The role of women is very important. It's part of the cosmovision. It's part of the identity of human beings. We wouldn't be able to exist with this, without this duality and this capacity of exchange between men and women and plural and societies are plural and diverse and that entails cooperation and 
this is part of the of the people's cooperation the fact that there are no isolation there is no isolation there is cooperation between people and we can create new worlds because we can create projects and we can work towards those pro projects that we build with the community. Agreements are fundamental. Agreements between peoples, between communities, among families, and between diversities. Once an agreement is established, it's possible to take all necessary steps towards achieving that agreement. And in that sense, we still live in, in a sort of spring, right? In a, in a, happy moment we are not in the in the end stage of the peoples we are in the in the flower in the blossoming age of the populations and the peoples and we are here to recreate the capacity that people have as as ayala as we have ayala as victor hugo says we are uh, we have many potentials we have a diversity of or wide range of options, but we are also part of a historic root that is not dead. The, the root is still there. Uh, our ancestors are there and they are giving us life and life is what we defend and we want life to be our fundamental agreement, the rights that we all have to live. So that would be the the possibility of facing modernity with this dynamic of vi vitality in the peoples and also the acknowledgement of the knowledge and the wisdom that maybe is hidden sometimes but it's real and it it's been implemented it's not something that's on the archives of people it's on the daily lives of the lives of the peoples now um will close this uh, webinar. So thank you very much for all your uh, excellent presentation and dialogue. And uh, on the one hand, we continue to critique the uh, neoliberalism, how it uh, brings negative effects on uh, our own and our societies. But on the uh, another hand, we also continue to learn to be a humble human and to uh, learn to be a nurturer of uh, biodiversity. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, so we unlearn and we learn again and again. Thank you very much. And uh, our next uh, webinar will be uh, 11 of July. Uh, the topic is about Against Health for All, 30 Years of Health Financialization. So uh, please stay with us and see you again. Um, the time is Hong Kong time, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Thank you very much.